Hey everyone, it's your favorite host, Marcus of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today we are going to talk, talk about my favorite topic, relationships. What's going on? What's happening in the relationship world? And why we are not winning in relationships. And I have this truly phenomenal woman, this incredible woman who is a dating professional, a true expert in the dating realm. She speaks across the world globally. She's a public speaker and she's speaking to us today to help us do better in relationships. You won't want to miss one second of what she has in store for us. Here we go. Hey everyone, it's your host, Marcus Norman, and I have come into the Gentleman Style Podcast stage today, Miss Harmony Woodington. It all started in 2012 when she was working as an esthetician in a tiny little spa and has grown and has flourished and has spread her wings and really developed. On top of her huge fashion sense, she's a true expert in the dating world and in the dating realm and she speaks to many different topics on how to have a healthy romantic relationships she's a professional she also helps us we're going to dive into the world of hypnotherapy and she's a healer and just beautiful inside and out this woman coming to the stage is going to help us uncover the mysteries and maybe even the mysteries to life and how we can better ourselves as individuals as men and women and for our women who are suffering in the dating world I can't think of a better guest speaker that I had the pleasure of finding on Gentleman Style Podcast Day today. So help me welcome the incredible, the amazing Miss Harmony Woodington. Welcome. Welcome to Gentleman Style Podcast Stage, Miss Harmony. Thank you for being here. Thank you for welcoming me with such a phenomenal intro. Thanks for the ego boost. <laughs> You are phenomenal. You did all the work. Your resume is extensive, expanding across many different facets, many different industries. Um, it, it, and you are here and making time for us today. So I couldn't be happier to have pinned, locked in on your calendar, ma'am. So thank you again. This thank is you. huge, 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 huge. Isn't she lovely, y'all? I told you. She's lovely. <laughs> Beautiful inside and out. But we also see the high accolades, the certifications, the degrees on the wall. Ma'am, what got you passionate to do what you currently do in the hypnotherapy, in the relationship space, in the public speaking space? Where did it all begin? Well, I just walked the easiest life ever. No problems, <laughs> no challenges. And I was just like, I just want to hang out with people that have childhood trauma so I can see what it's like. Live vicariously <laughs> through the trauma. <laughs> it's something nobody ever said that does this. Um, so I absolutely grew up with a phenomenal refining fire for a childhood. Uh, my mother was raised in a cult scenario and, uh, it was very, very traumatic for her whole childhood was extremely traumatic. My father grew up post second world war in Wales. And if anybody knows anything about Wales, Wales was heavily bombed during the second world war. So they had to really rebuild. And my grandfather who served in the war really used humor to try to get through it all but he was masking deep depression and sadness and ptsd which wasn't honored at the time so all six of his children all grew up with serious mental health issues and struggle with it today so i grew up with a father who was depressed suicidal and a ghost and then a mother who was very abusive and uh, and I ended up having to parent my own parents and to try to help them with their own trauma, trying to help them step up as parents, which I didn't successfully achieve doing, but it did create a lot of my own trauma and childhood issues that I had to reconcile in my adulthood. And just to go back to my career, like when I was 25, so I was a single mother with a five-year-old and coming out of the family that I came from, lacking money and with trauma and everything that I went through, I didn't believe that I was worth being anything more than something that was kind of like, you know, minimum wage kind of a thing. Like I didn't believe that a university would ever accept me. I didn't believe that the government would give me a student loan to get into school because I did not have the money to pay for it. So I didn't strive for greatness because I didn't think I was worth it. 
And I was guided to become an esthetician by, you know, friends and stuff because my family didn't guide me or encourage me or support me in doing anything that I wanted to do with my life. I had no sense of self-worth. So it was really through friends. And then even that going to the school was really scary for me. And the teacher who owned the school, she actually helped me apply for the student loan because I was so intimidated and scared and didn't even think that I would get it in the first place. And she's like, don't worry about it. Everybody that I help with this gets the student loan. I'm going to walk you through this. And when I did get it, I was in shock because I didn't believe that I was worthy. And then I remember my first day in school, standing in front of the classroom of all of the students feeling like I had just won the lottery going to aesthetic school. And everybody else was pretty complacent and didn't see it as that big of a deal. And so even just becoming an esthetician at the time was a massive win for me. And I did that for about a decade into, until 2012. And at that point, I had developed more self-worth, but still was really lacking when it came to my confidence. And I ended up the universe supported me. I ended up surrounding myself with a whole bunch of people who were actually mirroring my insecurity. So a lot of the people that I was working with were all deeply insecure and trying to fix it with their nails and their mm. fingers and all this exterior stuff. And they kept coming back to me month after month after month, getting their nails done, getting their facials, getting their slimming treatments, getting all their stuff. And their mindset wasn't getting better. So I found myself wanting to do something. I found delivered uh, this, this amazing desire to want to do more to the universe. And what does the universe do when you put a wish out there? It grants it. It grants it. If you don't jump off the cliff, it's going to push you unforgivingly off that cliff. And you're going you're gonna to drown or you're going to grow wings, right? And so I was on my way home. Uh, it was October 18th, 2012. I called my 12 year old son at the time and said, I'll be home in five minutes because I didn't have a long drive to get home from the spa that I was running at the time. And I didn't make it home because I was in a four car accident. Yeah. And I suffered from a severe concussion amongst other injuries that forced me to give up my job. And I no longer had a way to provide for my baby and for myself. And so I had to innovate. And no, I didn't go the illegal route. I actually started doing eyelash extensions at home. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally had a massage bed. I had everything that I needed. My 12-year-old son set up the massage bed. I lashed from my couch. And then when I was done, I would take painkillers and he would put the massage bed away and I would fall apart on the couch. So that was how I kept a roof over our heads because my my basically my overhead was about 3% and I was making 97% profit. So I was able to keep a roof over our heads doing one client a day, which was thank goodness I had that, right? And the, the clients, I, the clients from your esthetician followed you to the eyelash. Yeah, yeah. So I I called them and I let them know what happened. And of course, they were so loyal to me that they were like, I'll come see you at home. <laughs> so I was able to get the support through my clients to keep a roof over mine and my baby's heads as I was trying to figure out how to navigate healing. And I did discover naturopathic elements that did help to heal my concussion. It took about a year and a half for that to actually start taking place. And then in 2015, my father made an attempt on his life. And he ended up in the hospital. And at the same time, my partner, my newer partner that I started dating when I was actually after the car accident, uh, we started dating. Both him and I got phone calls within five minutes of each other saying that both of our fathers were in the hospital. His father was diagnosed with liver cancer and was in the hospital in Toronto. My father was in the hospital after making an attempt on his life. And both of us looked at each other and went, "I don't. you can't make this up. I don't even like we were in shock, right? Yeah. So I had to go to the hospital and orchestrate my father being put in a facility to be provided for and taken care of and spent a lot of money providing for him and supporting him. And then I went to the hospital in Toronto uh, to see his father in ICU and spent a week in Toronto. And that was where my psyche kind of got fragile. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it and definitely does. It can do that. It really did. Yeah. And so I did what most people do. And I, I went the traditional route and, you know, saw a couple of psychologists and they weren't in a position to be able to actually understand the existential crisis that I was having. 
And so I had to look outside of the box to look for the resolution that I was seeking while providing for my father and looking after my uh, my partner's father, who sadly did not make it. He passed away. My father did. And uh, he's still alive to this day, even though he's made multiple attempts since. So he still struggles with the depression. And I just reconciled the fact that I could lose him any day. And I have to be okay with that because I can't rescue him. It's his job to make a life or break it, right? And so that did put me in a place where I had to really next level my healing and let go of whatever choice he was going to make for himself and try to be okay with it. Because you can't be on pins and nails all the time worrying about what they're going to do. Like I, I tried to move him in. He didn't come and live with me. So what am I going to do? Right. And so drag him kicking and, and screaming. You know, <laughs> it's hard to do that with somebody in their, you know, fifties or sixties. Right. True. So I respected his autonomy and let him do what he was going to do and walked my own healing path. And I ended up kind of having to go outside of the box. And the first thing that was the most beautiful that a girlfriend advised me to do was to mourn the loss of the harmony that I thought I was. Because my identity was very much ripped away from me in all of this. And so I took time to mourn the loss of the harmony that, that was dictated to me, that I had become, that I had created. And when I had done that, then I went about discovering again and being curious and going into different circles and meeting new people and having all these different cool experiences and just discovering again and redefining myself. And in doing so, I discovered, you know, spiritual circles and all sorts of really cool cacao ceremonies and full moon ceremonies and meditation circles and uh, hypnotherapists and energy workers and all sorts of cool stuff that's outside of the box that actually brought me all the healing I was seeking. But one of the most important things that I discovered was that most of the wisdom that I sought was actually within and for a while, I was looking outwards for the answers, and I ended up realizing that a majority of the healing and the answers that I sought was within. So after going outwards for quite a long time, I ended up having this aha moment, and then I turned inwards. And that was when I became a hypnotherapist, and I learned how to tap into my own subconscious mind and how to communicate with my subconscious mind and how to reconcile things and update my programs and do all these different things and how to release energy that is no longer serving me because every time we have a trauma whether it is an emotional trauma or whether it's a physical trauma there is an emotional trauma and an energetic trauma to go with it so you can injure yourself playing football right break your leg you end up at the hospital you go to the hospital they but they set the leg, they put a cast on it, and then they set you up with physiotherapy. At no point does a nurse or a doctor come and talk to you and go, okay, how traumatizing was it when you were in the middle of that NFL game and you broke your leg and got carted off the freaking the field? Are you okay? How do you feel? There is, it just doesn't happen, right? So this is where the problem is, is that the physicality is honored and supported and healed, but the energetic trauma, the emotional trauma doesn't get supported. So they just heal. And a lot of the time when we experience pain as we're getting older, people just accept the fact that that's a part of aging. It's not. It's the energetic trauma still sitting in that place. And your body is creating pain to tell you there is an incongruent vibration present that needs to be honored and healed. So when you change and update your mental operating system and you don't honor the emotional trauma or the energy that needs to be shifted, you're going to have pain or what I call dis-ease within the body that will talk to you. And if you release the energetic trauma, but you don't update the mental operating system, you're running outdated programs that are going to create more of what you do not want. So the healing process needs to be holistic, which is why I certified in hypnotherapy and energy work, and then later actually got into neuroscience and stuff like that as well, because and I it, really wanted to deep dive. 
the energy work is Reiki or something else? No, I deliberately did not play the Reiki game. Not that I'm here to knock anybody that does Reiki, but Reiki is the dime a dozen. And I wanted to play in a world that was outside of that because I just saw too many people that were certifying in Reiki and who do you trust and what school do you go to that's reputable? And it was just like, it was just red bloody water and I didn't want to play, right? But I discovered a modality called pranic healing, which was developed by, uh, he's Filipino and Chinese. He's no longer with us, but his name is Master Chow Kok Sui. And he developed a modality and I decided to go and play in that world. And it opened up the awareness so that I could engage again from an energetic level. But literally it was just a launching pad because even what I do isn't necessarily based on pranic. I'm also certified in Emotion Code Body Code by Dr. Bradley Nelson as well, which is another healing modality. And again, just a launching pad. You know what I mean? So what I do in even my hypnotherapy, launching pad, I don't hypnotize people. I haven't hypnotized anyone in a long time. And the reason that I don't is because if you come to me and say, Harmony, I have this problem. I'd like it to change. I'll be like, okay, hey, dope. I got you. And then you come to me and I do the hypnosis and then I change your mind for you. And then you go, yay. And then another thing comes up and then you're like, I have to go give her more money. I have no idea what she did to change my mind for me. Right. You so in my mind, that's unethical because I keep the power. I know how your mind works and I keep taking your money because you don't know how it works. Right. And, and I don't know how to initiate the new mindset shift. You I, got don't know, it. I don't know how to trigger my mind, my own mind. Yep. So it's almost a, a loss of sense, self-control. You got it. Exactly. And once I've been in practice for a while, I realized the ethics of it. And I didn't want to be taking people's money unethically. It's my job to empower everybody that I work with. And that's always been my goal. And so I realized that teaching people how their mind works and teaching them how to create a harmonious relationship with their own mind and understanding that their mind is exactly the same as this thing you're playing with all day, that it updates itself and it has apps and it has programs and it has an operating system. And when you update it, when you work with it, when you make sure that everything is working seamlessly, then it's going to play beautifully for you and you can use it. Well, if your mind is the same, I'm just wondering when the last time anybody did an update on their mind. Sure. <laughs> right? Sure. Yeah. And when yeah. it's not updated, then you can't download the newest apps, right? It's going to slow down. It's going to get bogged down. It's got to be updated on the regular. So once you understand how that works, you can start to flag and pay attention to outdated programs. And then you can actually go and create new neural pathways for yourself because you then understand how it works. So you can direct your life as your agendas and your goals and your dreams change, right? So everything flows seamlessly. I want to, uh, that is huge and, and it's profound and it's necessary. I think there's a lot of us, you know, I don't think there's anybody walking this planet that isn't healed or needs some kind of healing. And to sit down with an expert and a professional like yourself to really uncover that that and do help them do that inner work. I want to to dive on your your years of growing up. Where do you think that disbelief in yourself, the 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 lack of you didn't feel that you was enough, you didn't feel that college was for you, even in the face of adversity, when someone else believed in you enough you still had a hard time accepting that I am good enough to be an esthetician. I am good enough to be in this room. When do you think that started? It came from a whole childhood of having a mother that treated me like an evil devil temptress, a whole child. She had all sorts of uh, bulldozer. She had all sorts of nasty nicknames for me. And uh, she rode me like a racehorse. I was never good enough. I could never do enough. And she would yell at me for hours until I would literally look at her and tell her that I was a screw up and she needed to give up on me. So me saying those things out of self-defense, obviously in repetition, I didn't realize I was program programming myself to feel like a screw up and a lost cause. And constantly being yelled at and pushed and just that verbal abuse, she never physically abused me. But you know, as we understand, the verbal abuse I, in my mind is absolutely significantly more damaging. So I didn't know that I was being programmed 
to to believe that I wasn't enough. And then on top of that, at about grade four, we had lived on uh, on the mountain and I was going to one school where everybody was in the same demographic. Everybody earned the same amount of money. Like it, there was, we were all equal and we were all friends and it was great. And then they built a whole bunch of multi-million dollar houses up from where I lived and they built a school and they made all of us that were in the catchment go to this school. And all of a sudden I was going to school with a bunch of kids that were multimillionaires. And I was clearly a secondary citizen because I was on the wrong side of the school. I was on the bottom side of the school. And that sent a powerful message to me that those people that had money had more and had everything handed to them. And it was really beat into me over the years that, you know, that I was lacking something and I wasn't enough. So between the environment that I grew up in at home and then the environment that I grew up in socially from about nine on, it was very, very clear to me. The message was driven home repetitively that I was a secondary citizen. So it really did take me going down this beautiful healing path to get to the realization that the lack of love and the hardships and the trials and everything that I came through was for a purpose. I grew up in an environment with a lack of love and acceptance because I was meant to be love on this earth. I grew up with the trauma and the hardship and everything that I went through because every time a beautiful soul comes to me with their pain and their trauma and their hardship, I empathize. There's nothing that a client hasn't brought to me that I cannot empathize and support them with. Nothing shocks me. Nothing. And I don't sit in a place of judgment. I am an unconditionally loving cheerleader. And I am so because of the path that I walked. I would not be serving my clients with the ferocity and the unconditional love that I have for them had I not experienced that hardship. So I want to be so clear that I absolutely do not tell my story from a place of woe is me. I tell my story from a place of I chose this refining fire so that I could become the loving cheerleader that I am and have been for my clients for a decade now. You have done inner work and I love in your speaking, in your your bio, you acknowledge the love of your husband and your family today. And I love that because I think that is so necessary in your work. How necessary is having someone else um, make space for you and have time for you and listen to you and hear you? Because the women in your in your eyelashes work and your esthetician work, they were venting to you, right, to, to hear them out. And like you said, they were covering up their seeming flaws or their belief flaws and their insecurities with makeup and hair and nails. And so how important is it to have someone in your corner? Who did you have in your corner at your lowest? If, if anyone, was it a sibling? Was it an uncle? Was it anyone? How important is that? It's instrumental. When we are in stagnation, when we are seeking change, our subconscious mind not having a neural pathway to create the change will try to keep us stuck in the present reality that we're in because it can't map anything out. And it because it can't predict what's going to happen to you or where you're going to go to keep you safe, it will create internal dialogue to convince you to stay where you are. And to be in that place where you're stuck and have somebody that shows up and says, I've got your back. I'm going to support and I'm going to hold space for you while you navigate this new pathway, this new life, this new journey. It just brings the strength that we need to be able to venture out and try something new and do something new. It just brings a element to it whereas we might not have been able to do it on our own but with a cheerleader with somebody who's unconditionally loving and sees our potential and sees us so much greater than we see ourselves it's inspiring you find yourself wanting to actually rise to the potential that they see in you when you can't see that for yourself and everything in your mind is just telling you to stay where you are who played that role for me was my scotty my life partner the partner that I'm just about to celebrate 11 years with. 
he was my unconditionally loving cheerleader. And he held space for me when I was injured and did everything that I needed without complaint. He didn't complain because we couldn't go out because it was too loud and too chaotic and it hurt my head. You know, he didn't give me a hard time because I didn't have a personality while I had a concussion. <laughs> he had my back through the physical injuries and then he had my back as I started my emotional and mental healing journey as well. And there was upheaval, there was emotion, there was absolutely backlash, there was crying, there was flowing things, there was processing things. And I told him in advance as I was starting it that I don't know what's gonna come out, I don't know what's gonna happen, I, I have no idea how this is gonna work, but if there is fallout, I apologize in advance. And I also ask you to hold me accountable and support me. So as I learned coping mechanisms and emotional intelligence and ways to process things, he learned it and then held me accountable. So when I was triggered and having a difficult time, he'd be like, okay, you need to hold space for your emotions. You need to go for a walk. You need to pamper yourself. Like he'd call me out and support me. And when I didn't believe in myself and I was struggling, he was that sustaining force, that that beautiful teddy bear that I could just curl into a ball and be held and loved and supported. And he would say the things that I needed to keep going. So absolutely, for 11 years, he's been in my life since shortly after my car accident. And he's been there through all of my healing journey. And She almost got me all. She almost got me. <laughs> she almost got me. Uh, I love this. This is this is foundational. What in in your expertise, your professional expertise, what is the foundation that is missing in 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 most relationships? Not a cookie cutter answer, right? But what is at the core, a kind of a common denominator that you see when you counsel clients and work with people and work with with individuals and or couples? So it's sitting right beside me, but this beautiful book that I published in 2022, which is the bestseller, by the way, has a framework to it that actually is remember you. Because what do we do when we get into relationships? We actually tend to become more like the person we're attracted to, because if we put ourselves more in their orbit, then they're going to spend more time with us right? So we tend to lose ourselves. We tend to forget ourselves. And so remember you is actually an acronym and there are different aspects to it. And I'm not going to dive into it. If you want to find out what the acronym is, you're just going to have to go buy the book. I'm not, I'm not telling you everything. However, here's a couple of things that are integral is you need to accept everybody that you interact with in your life unconditionally. Stop trying to make people behave a certain way to earn your trust and acceptance. You are binding and controlling people. You are taking their free agency by telling them that they need to do something to earn your acceptance and trust. Trust is not a word that is in my vocabulary. Why? because I don't believe in taking people's free agency. I don't need to trust you to decide what I'm gonna do with you. There is only one way I am vulnerable to you and that's physically. And I make sure that my physicality is taken care of because I don't do things to put myself into situations where I can get hurt. And if I do, I know self-defense, I know martial arts, I'm capable. I'm almost six feet tall as well. So I'm not a girl you generally want to mess with. I'm an Amazon. So I, I provide for and prepare myself from a physical standpoint. From an emotional standpoint, I'm ineffable. And the reason I'm ineffable is because my worth, my security, and my love is all sourced within. So there's nothing you can do or say that can challenge my worth, right? So when you show up and you accept people for who they are, you unconditionally love them and let them be who they are, it puts the other person in a place where they actually let the armor down because you're not putting your armor up saying you need to do something to behave to let for me to let my guard down. And it's a it's a subconscious interaction, right? If I show up with my guard up, you're going to subconsciously receive that and you're put your guard up. Now we're trying to work through armor to get to each other, which is dysfunctional right from the get go, right? And let me tell you, ladies, I understand where you're coming from. We have been defending ourselves and dealing with predators since we were literally teenagers. I hear you. 
However, being who I am and being, you know, the kind of a person who has gotten attention since she was 11 years old, I have managed this. Where we discern is when we look at a person, we interact with them, we show up with unconditional love, and then we decide whether we want to cherry pick the human or send them packing with love, right? It is my choice whether I want to have that person in my orbit or not. I can unconditionally love them, but I don't need to have them in my world. True. That's <laughs> so, so true. Huge, 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 huge. I, so, okay, I kind of handed two or three to you there, but. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I love that because you reminded me of a social experiment that they did. I can't remember which, which um, university or science um, college did it, but it basically took um, people and they had two, two groups, two focus groups. And they said, this group, you guys, we're going to just um, have you work out and work out on this gym equipment. And then we're going to collect your sweat. And then the other group, hey, you guys, we're going to take you guys and we're going to go skydive. Right. And then we're going to um, take your sweat samples from there. And so then they bring in a third um, group study group and they had people. This is disgusting. They had people study and smell the different sweat sweat that they collected from oh, each study group yeah. and what they learned is you can actually pass along fear and so the people who smelt the sweat of the people who went skydiving um instantly became engrossed and became fearful even though they weren't in the same space and so what you're saying to me what sounds like to me is when this work isn't done when you haven't done the inner work the inner healing and you haven't you you try and force that on someone else, even if you think you're not saying it, you can subconsciously force your will on another person because yeah. we're designed a, a woman's body is the most incredible thing I have ever known. It's 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 that that it's within us, it's it's within a woman um to know when her environment is not conducive to her well-being. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's, a, that's, that's when it, that's what makes your hair stand up when you walk down a dark alley, ladies, it's, it's real and you can't dismiss it. You can't dismiss that, that, that sense. And it, it's so powerful. It's, it's so powerful. We really need to listen to one another. And you said something that's beautiful. I think we need to stop going in relationships, trying to force ourselves on other people. Let someone show you who they are and let them be that and love them for it love yeah. them for it and love them for who they are and love who they're they're being in that moment and let the canvas develop on its own without exactly. any judgment exactly and when i focus on myself and i build myself up and i invest in myself to make myself a better person and my partner cheerleads me in doing so and he invests in himself and builds himself up and i cheerlead him to do so then we're creating and maintaining beautiful people that we both want to interact with, right? It's it's the difference between dependence and independence and then interdependence, right? I want to have a relationship with my partner, but I don't rely on him for my happiness. If I am unhappy, it's not because he's not telling me that I'm beautiful all the time. It's not because he needs to be more affectionate. It's not because he's doing or not doing something. It's because there's something going on with me. And I need to be accountable for my feelings at all times. Not asking him to be or do something to make me happy. It's not his job. It's not his job. And vice versa. It is my job to support my emotional health and to make sure I am where I need to be. Our partner is not our completer. That whole Toby Maguire thing is BS, okay? My partner is not my completer. He is my complement. I am already everything. And he complements that and vice versa. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> two mics, two mics. I want to touch on this because this is the new thing, right? That people are now figuring out. I think this has been a thing since the beginning and we should have had it all along, but what is emotional intelligence and why is that significance in the dating world? 
So emotional intelligence is integral because a lot of the time uh, we, uh, we're we actually taught as we're growing up in society that we're feeling something that it's somebody else's fault. Somebody made us feel that way. And really in all reality, nobody can make you feel anything. People can do things to you for sure. But what you're feeling is in response to the stimulus. So if you understand that, like, let's just, I my favorite color is purple. Okay. So if somebody came to me and I was wearing green or something like that. And they said, you know, I hate green. It's an ugly color. I'd be like, okay, cool. Cool story, bro. Don't care. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if they came to me and said, you look dumb in purple. I cannot stand that. I'd be like, you need to check yourself. <laughs> Cause I know I look amazing in purple. I would have an opinion because I have something attached to it. Now that's just a very, very simple example of that, but it is just an example to show you that if you don't have programs or sensitivity or trauma or something attached to what's being said or done, you won't react. But if you do, there is absolutely going to be something triggered. And so for us to understand that every time we have an emotional reaction, it's because there is a button that was pushed and that button was created in your life experience. Now, they push the button, but it is your responsibility to be accountable for what surfaced as a result of that button being pushed. So what I teach my clients is that the stimulus, the person is your perfect button pusher. Hmm. So we it they're surfacing something but they're actually surfacing something that needs to be honored and healed for you to evolve and expand into a better person so with that in mind the only thing i should be saying to my perfect button pusher is thank you for the opportunity to heal gold you guys are not going this is gold this <laughs> is epic ma'am you are a true gem and phenom and absolutely changing the absolute game i love this this is this is nuggets you can't get anywhere else um where you where can people get the book you you touched on the book amazon there. amazon yeah um, just look up uh harmony whittington it's called create a healthier romantic relationship it literally says what it does it's the most simple thing ever and it one gives you an opportunity to get to know me and my story. I absolutely share my story and uh, particularly the evolution of my relationship with Scott and how he held space for me in my healing journey. And I discovered and created a healthy relationship with Scott as I was healing because my parents absolutely showed me what dysfunctional looks like beautifully. Right. And everyone around me showed me dysfunction. I did not see a healthy relationship around me at all. My uncle was just like talking to me about that, you know, when I was younger and he's like, are you going to get married? And I was like, I don't know why I would, because all of you guys are showing me what marriage looks like and I don't want to play. Ooh. And he was like, fair, <laughs> fair. How about you do your own thing and see what works? And I'm like, that's what I'm doing. Thanks for your permission. <laughs> you know, I didn't ask. Way so, ahead of you, uncle. That's exactly it. So I am going to let you know that this, this book was burst as a result of COVID because I ended up going out and I was meeting people as we were starting to open up again and all sorts of relationships ended and all sorts of relationships were struggling. And I had a conversation with a guy that was married and I was talking to him about my teachings and he was just like, I wish my wife was here right now. She needs to hear this. And I realized that the teachings that I've been developing since I started doing this, you know, to help clients in my treatment room needed to be brought to the masses. So from the from the inception of it to the time that it was published, it was literally six months. Like I, it was the only thing I did until this book was birthed and it became a bestseller within 24 hours. So I think it was needed, maybe. I don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And you can get it on Amazon. It's available right now, right here today. Y'all get a copy. We need this. We are not doing well in relationships. We're not doing well. We're not doing well. I'll just I'll just leave it at that. You could say what you want. You can put whatever characteristic you want in there. Sex, money, finances, religion. Um, and now we got elections. Like if we don't agree on politics, we don't go together. We're not doing well. We're not yeah. doing well in all aspects. Ma'am, you have dropped so many nuggets this episode. Uh, if you had one more nugget in the hat, right? If you had one more nugget to share to that young girl whose back is against the wall, she's feeling overwhelmed. She's a single mom. She she 
boyfriend just left husband wants a divorce what would you say to that girl right here right now who needs that that that's you said your husband's name is steve scott Scotty. scott she needs her scott right now she needs her Scotty. She, yeah what would you say to her right now let's go back to younger harmony baby harmony um the thing that i would say is don't look to somebody else to fix things and to rescue you the only person that needs to rescue you is you the love that you're seeking from the world from an outside source from a soulmate and a partner is that's not where the love is the most important love that you need to seek is your own it is the only love that will actually be self-sustaining so invest in you, do a deep dive in you. You have a beautiful soul and a brilliant mind and a beautiful purpose in this life. And when you dive into that and you develop worth and security and love that is sourced within, you will become a force of nature. And you will have the strength and the confidence to invest in your dreams, to invest in your life purpose, to invest in others who need you and the love and the experience you have to bring to the world. So dive into you and fall in love with you first and then bring that love to the world. Can't get any better than that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. How can people connect? How can people find you? The train has already left the station, but it's not not too late for them to get on board and get connected with Harmony. You can go to my website, coachingwithharmony.com, and uh, you can take a look at the different things that I have to offer. You can go to Amazon and you can take a look at the books that I have as well. And for anybody that wants to just see what's going on and have a conversation with me before you know doing a deep dive, you can absolutely book a free call through my website as well, which uh, will allow for us to get to know each other better to see if it's a fit. And I just want to be clear to everybody who's out there. I am here to be your unconditionally loving cheerleader. I am here to see you so much greater than you see yourself so that you will want to rise to what I already see in you. You are capable of so much more than you know, and there's nothing more beautiful than having somebody that sees that to help inspire you to create beautiful, powerful change in this life. I hear you. I told y'all, I told y'all, a true heart of gold. We got to let Miss Harmony go. We are out of time. This woman is changing lives. She is changing the world and she is absolutely epic. But you all know how to get connected. Connect, 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 because that's how we get better. That's how we change the world. And that's how Miss Harmony is helping us, helping we get to a better space and find our own harmony. Like we end every show sadly <laughs> we always end with this word of encouragement i always end with this word of encouragement take care of your friends take care of your family and always always take care of business this is marcus your favorite gentleman and harmony woodington connect connected the woman the man i was gonna say the man the woman the legend herself helping us get to a better space love you guys bye Thank you.